Okay, in this section, we're going to talk about understanding the problem. This can be a lot of fun. We're going to talk to people. We're going to get out in the real world, and we're actually engaged in conversations. We're going to basically be scientists in this process. So it's going to be a lot of fun. This is probably one of my favorite parts of the startup journey and probably one of the most important ones as well. So let's jump into it. My goal for you today is to gain an understanding of the problem that you're solving with your service uh, for your customers so that you can confidently move forward with what you're offering, which is your service. All right, so after this section, you have a really good idea of what the actual key problems that you're solving are and how to actually build the rest of your plans and set up your company for success. So what's the hypothesis for the problem that you're solving for your service? So what comes to mind when you think about the service that you've chosen and what comes to mind when you think about the actual you know, pain points, the actual challenges that the customer currently has and the problems that you're actually solving. So it's okay if you don't have any thoughts already, but we're gonna use this process to really ingrain that in our heads to really get that understanding because we wanna shape our startup around these problems. So we're gonna introduce to you the value proposition canvas. So for those of you who haven't heard of this before, the Value Proposition Canvas is a tool which we can help ensure that our service is positioned, that, that we use to help ensure that our service is positioned around what the customer values and needs. It's a very important part of it. So we're not building a business plan yet. We're not building you know, our financial projections, anything like that before we understand the actual uh, customer's needs and values. All right. So the Canvas was originally developed by a, uh, a really uh, intelligent guy. This guy's really Really smart dude in the entrepreneurial world. His name's Dr. Alexander Osterwalder. And it's a framework that really just ensures that there's a fit between what the, act, the customer's needs are. So what are their problems and what are their values and needs and what we're actually offering. So this is how we're going to take a fresh look on our industry. We talk about that being a really unique advantage that we have over our competitors because we're actually going to take a fresh look at the industry. We're not caught up in the service we're offering yet. We're going to just analyze what the, what the customer's challenges are. And then after we understand our customer's challenges, we're really going to be able to make the best possible solution for them. So there's two aspects of the value proposition canvas. There's the customer profile and there's the company's value proposition. So this is what it looks like. This is how it's designed. This, you know, this, this, you'll see this in a number of different ways. And this is the actual canvas. So as you can see, it's very straightforward. You're not going to build this elaborate business plan on a Word document or anything like that. You actually can just use like sticky notes, dot jots, things like that. Cause we're really just, we're really just looking at it from a really practical standpoint. So on the left side, we got the value proposition on the right side, we got the customer profile. And as you can see, we've got to match the two up. So on the customer profile, if we look at the gains, we have to come up with gain creators. So we have to find ways to actually create uh, the, uh, the desired benefits of our service for the customer. So those are additional gains. These are things that they, that'll make them happy in the service that that'll make them happy with getting the, getting the, uh, you know, getting this, process out of the way and getting it done. There's the pains. So when we think about pains, we want to think about what actually causes them, you know, challenges, whether it's financial, whether it's emotional, whether it's functional. So what are the current pains with doing the service themselves or getting a company to do the service? So what's their current pains with just getting this thing done? So like for me, Matt's car cleaning service, what's the pains with cleaning their car? And when we think about our, our value proposition, we want to think about how we can relieve those pains. So how are we going to specifically address each of those pains? we we'll actually create those pain relievers. And then lastly, we've got the customer jobs. So this is the functional, emotional, any type of job that they have related to this service. So practically speaking, we only have one job when we're thinking about car cleaning services. It's just having the car cleaned. That's literally the functional job of the customer. It's the most important job that we're addressing. That's all we need to really think about there. And then our products and services, again, it's literally just car cleaning services. All right. So let's look at it. Let's look at our example here. Oh, actually, we're gonna we're gonna actually talk about these first, what they mean, and we'll talk about our example. So we talk about the customer profile, as I just mentioned, the gains or the benefits that the customer expects and needs. Um, what would delight the customer? Things that may increase the likelihood of adopting a value proposition. So really, just looking at it as uh, an opportunity, first of all, to expand the size of the market because they might have, be, have desired benefits that aren't being addressed right now, and we can address those, and it'll make them more likely to get the service. Or they're just, you know, they're used to getting a service done with a certain company and they really are not delighted. They have no additional uh, happiness from this service other than just the job. They're only just the customer's jobs being addressed. We look at the pain points. These are the negative experiences. So the negative emotions, negative risks, anything that the customer experiences with the process of getting the job done. So cleaning their car. And lastly, you know, customer's jobs, the functional, social, and emotional tasks customer have are trying to perform and the problems that they're trying to solve and needs they wish to satisfy. 
So I think that's all pretty straightforward. We're looking at this from a three dimensions, three angles. Basically, when we're looking at the problem, we're looking at what their jobs are. So what the actual task is, their pains. Uh, so what are the negative experiences they're currently having and the gains? So what benefits that they, what do they expect? And this is, this will give you a good idea of what those mean in depth. So when we look at our value map. This corresponds directly to the customer's pains, gains, and jobs. So gain creators obviously are how the service creates customers gains and how it offers added value to the customer. So when we're looking beyond just the service we offer, how can we add additional value? Pain relievers is a description of exactly how the services alleviate the customer's pains. So they have the job, they got to clean their car. How can we alleviate that pain the best way possible? And then their services. So the services we create gains and the service in which we create gains, relieve pain and which underpin the creation of value for the customer. So this is really an exciting process because we're really looking at our startup from a not not a business perspective, but a problem solution perspective, which is the fundamental core of every business. And when we look at it from this approach first, we're going to build our business more practically around what our customers tell us, what our customers' needs are, what our customers, you know, what, what kind of pains, gains, and uh, jobs do they have right now, and how are we addressing those the best. It's a really scientific approach. We're essentially engineering our startup. And this approach is actually used commonly by almost every startup that you see, especially tech startups. Startups in Silicon Valley, you know, some of the greatest companies that are around today use the the value proposition canvas when they break down their solutions and their problems uh, to a very simplistic, basic form. And what we want to do is apply this methodology, apply this science-backed uh, teaching style to our service business, which is something that's not commonly done in this industry. So it's going to give us a huge advantage. All right, so. We're talking about achieving this fit, like I kind of just mentioned, this kind of gives you the overall uh, bird's eye view of what we're actually trying to achieve. So after we list the gain creators, pain relievers, services, each point uh, can be ranked from nice to have to essential in terms of the value to the customer. So we're gonna start off by creating a larger list and these are just gonna be different points based on the criteria of that. So for pains, we're gonna think of all the possible pains, gains, we're gonna think about all the possible gains. So we're gonna think about all the possible situations. And, and then when we think about a fit, uh, it's achieving the products and service offered as part of the value proposition addresses the most significant pains and gains from the customer profile. So we don't wanna address everything because we can't do that, it's gonna, it's gonna make our focus too varied. We're not going to have a specific call to action. So we want to, we really want to address just the most essential pains and gains. So we can, when we first create our value proposition canvas, we're going to map out, we're going to brainstorm everything we can think of, then we're going to narrow it down. So when we identify the value proposition on paper, it's only the first stage. It is then, it is then necessary to validate what's important to customers and get their feedback on our value proposition. It's very important to do this. A value proposition canvas is useless if we don't validate it. We validate our assumptions with actual conversations, with actual real life data. All right, so we're going to use data in this process. It's not going to just be a, a fun brainstorming activity. It's going to be, you know, we're going to do a hypothesis. We're going to wear our scientific hat a little bit, our investigative hat, and we're going to actually go out there and talk to people and figure out if our problems are actually right and what are the most important problems. So these insights are being used afterwards. We're going to rebuild our value proposition canvas, or we're just going to change it up if it was already pretty good. I assume we're going to get most of our problems pretty right, but we want to figure out what are the most important problems. We want to figure out what is that actual, what are the key value proposition uh, or value points that we're adding, and we're going to build our strategy from there. All right, so let's do an example. For Matt's Car Cleaning Company, we're going to build a hypothesis or hi, uh, like a hypothetical value proposition first, uh, and then we're going to talk about the next steps after that. So if we look at the customer profile, we list some gains here. So potential gains, making the car more accessible to use. Uh, so, you know, if the car's messy, the car's dirty, it's got gum, food, things like that, they can't be used for business purposes. You, you don't want to bring people in that, things like that. So we're increasing accessibility. We want we want it to have more uses than just personal. Uh, being proud of their car. So we want the customer uh, or, or the customer. So I'm talking from the customer's pr perspective. I should probably not go into elaborate detail about um, about the business yet. So we're looking at making more a car more accessible to use the customer uh, might want to use their car for more than just personal use they want to open it up to bring customers maybe they're, they have a golf game and they're too embarrassed they, they need to meet the customer there or take an uber and they'd rather just drive i'm um, being proud of their car so being able to drive to work or drive different places and show it off it's a brand new looking car more time to spend with the family and leisure activities so not having to worry about the actual service or the process getting the service done um, getting more years of the car. So if you take care of the car, if you treat it well, you have that respect for it, it's probably going to last longer. So these are all things that the customer, you know, some desired outcomes that they can, that they, that they want that maybe they don't have, maybe they have to an extent right now, but they're looking for. 
pains are, you know, annoyance, time spent cleaning their own car, so they don't want to do it. I mean, it's just something that takes a lot of time. It's annoying. It's detail oriented. It's just not a fun activity. They don't want to scratch or damage their car, so they don't trust themselves with that expertise. They know that there's a certain level of expertise needed. They don't want to damage themselves. They don't have necessary cleaning supplies and equipment available, so they don't want to purchase all these supplies and equipment just for one car. Just clean one car. It doesn't make any economic sense for them. Uh, it's inconvenient booking process with their current co companies. Um, it's a, definitely a pain point. They have to wait weeks to get it done. They have to plan ahead, do all this stuff. They don't want to actually have to do that. Unsatisfactory clean received from the other companies in the past. So maybe the companies hired students, they hired employees that didn't really care, paid the minimum wage, and they gave them minimum effort in return. So they've got unsatisfied. Uh, they've had unsatisfactory clean experience. They've never been too happy with it. And then we narrow that down to the jobs. So having a clean car, impressing friends and peers at work, and having peace of mind. These are the jobs they want to have. Those um, they they in general, uh, they're you know for example, their functional jobs having a clean car. But then some of their emotional uh, jo jobs are impressing friends. So just having status, you know, ha pulling up to work every day in a clean BMW, freshly waxed, freshly polished. It looks great. Uh, and just having peace of mind, not having to worry about something. So everyone does. Everyone's job from a larger scale is just to have peace of mind and and have have everything in their life taken care of. So if we, let's look at how we're going to create value for the customer. All right, so for our game creators, addressing the gains that we just talked about, we're gonna have a cleaning process focused on being proud of your car. It's gonna be communicated when we're talking about our service, we're gonna focus on the right details. We're going to um, just focus entirely on um, helping people be proud of their car. So showcasing the visual aspect of the car. Minimal customer involvement in the process so they can have more time for leisure and family activities. Pricing reflecting the budget of the customer so they're not gonna overpay, they're not going to, um, you know, they're just gonna have a very affordable service to get a lot of value in return. And we have a service that provides more value than our price charge. So we're gonna provide that premium service, we're gonna work hard, we're gonna have attention to details, um, and we're going to uh, charge a, a low amount. So it's gonna be a really high value compared to price paid uh, conversion there. Then we're gonna look at pain relievers. So it's quick and immediate service without any hassle. Process does not uh, does not cause any damage to the vehicle. There's high attention to detail and we avoid poor, poor service quality. So we're addressing all those concerns we talked about in the pains. Uh, pain section and we're always available to take a call and book book the service we're always ready to go we have next day service they don't have to have an inconvenient process literally just google us or they see us at their doorstep they see a flyer on their doorstep see a lawn sign very easy for them to get a hold of us and book the service and you can trust that we're going to have a really convenient process to actually uh, execute the service it's not going to have any hassle they don't even have to be involved we just get it done a car looks perfect and they didn't even have to worry about it and the process does not cause any damage so we have a really thought out process and lastly, our services, it's mobile car detail, car cleaning service, and we have local student support. So we're local students, we're local student entrepreneurs, and they're supporting us. All right, so I've created my hypothesis. These are all just notes myself that I've taken. I have not validated any of these. These are just assumptions I have about the service and potential pains, gains, and jobs customers are going to have and how we're going to address those. Now I need to actually validate to see this, see if I'm right. I need to talk to people. How am I going to know if I just guess or just, you know, these are things that you can't find on Google. You have to actually talk to people in your target market. So how are we going to do that? Introducing customer discovery. So this isn't something I'm making up. This is part of the value proposition design. This is part of designing your, your startup, all right? So this is a process of questioning your core business assumptions. So you have all these assumptions. You've made these guesses about your service. Now, if it's done correctly, you can actually provide evidence behind an assumed product market fit. So you can actually validate that. It's not going to be looking at numbers, looking at secondary data. It's going to be talking to people directly. So this process actually involves you talking to people in your target market. So you do this by setting up non-selling interviews with people you might think be a potential customer. So... You're not selling them. It's very important to mention this. You are not selling them on your service. You barely, you ideally, you don't even want them to know very much about what you're offering. You are just asking questions and gathering data. This is, you, you're a scientist or a detective. You're gaining data to verify your hypothesis. You are not selling them on your service, all right? That's nothing to do with this. In the future, they might be a good lead for you, but at this point, it needs to be very clear that you have nothing to sell. You are just gathering data. You're a student who wants to gain some data for their startup. It's a very good pitch to sell to people, and I think more often than not, people will say yes. All right, so you want to keep a couple things in mind with this. One great conversation is far greater than 10 poor conversations. So if you, so right now, really quality is 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 over quantity times a million. If you can have three to five 
high quality conversations, you are well on your way. You're probably good to move forward. You don't need to set up 50, 100 interviews. You don't need to spend weeks, months on this process. You just want to find a couple of people who can provide you with some really great insights. And some people are going to provide you additional insights that will be like meaningful from, from their own experience in business, from their own experience working with customers. So you can amplify that. So genuinely, you don't want to waste time doing like just doing a bunch of interviews just for the sake of saying that you did interviews. You want to you want to find people who are actually in your target market, who you're actually going to talk to and have a couple of conversations with these people and have those in-depth conversations. So how can you start with this? It might be intimidating to actually think about finding these people. So it starts off with family members. So talk, you know, you might want to do customer discovery with your parents, but talk at least talk to these people that have access to networks. So your, for example, your parents, you might ask them to talk to some of their friends, some of their friends that are in your area, maybe um, not in your area, maybe just outside the area. But anyone that's in your family is a great place to start. So that even includes aunts and uncles and cousins, anyone in your family that you can reach out to and tell what you're doing. Family will always support you more than anyone else. So family's a great place to start. And I would even count that as a customer discovery interview. If you actually sat down with your parents, did a zoom call, did a phone call, did whatever you needed to do, but you actually had an interview with them and talked about your service. I would count that as a valid customer discovery call. And you can do that with a few other people. Next, you go to family, friends, um, so again, your parents, friends, friends of your cousins, just anyone that's that's not directly related to you, but in your network. Um, so family, friends, and then parents of close friends. So even just asking your friends that you know you you know they live in a good area, they know you know they live like close to where you want to operate, that they're in that target market. Maybe you've heard of them getting the service before. Asking your friends if you can talk to their parents about this is. I mean, it's it's like a little bit like it's a little bit, I guess, like it might feel uncomfortable, but is a really, really good thing to do. And ultimately, your friends, parents are going to love it. They're going to love that the fact that you're wanting to talk to them, wanting to get their insight and knowledge. And, you know, a lot of people like sharing their insight and knowledge, by the way. This isn't something that, you know, it is something you have to give you a little bit of their time, but you can work it around their schedule. You can do it when it's convenient for them. People love sharing their knowledge. It's a great, great thing to do to talk to, especially talking to a young student. And last thing, professors or teachers at your school, you know, this could be a good option, but if you're going to do this, make sure that they actually fit into your market. I made the mistake of just setting up interviews with all my professors and I got some really awful insights. I didn't, I didn't do any preliminary, um, you know, investigation into actually if they would be a potential customer. I literally talked to someone in his twenties, in his late twenties, didn't even have a house, didn't even have a barbecue. You know, for me, it was barbecue cleaning services, didn't even have a barbecue. And I'd still set up this interview, wasted all this time going to his office, did all these things. Not smart. So make sure your professor's actually in your target market. They actually could be a potential customer for your service. And if you do find one or two like that, it's a great, great option. They don't even have to be your professors. It can be any professor at the school. I think they'll be more than happy to help you. So choose people who fit the demographic of your potential customer. If you talk to people that wouldn't be potential customers, these insights may not be helpful. In fact, they're they're almost definitely not going to be helpful. You might get some insights into like who won't be your customer, but that's not the point for the for this stage. You'll get a lot of those insights when you actually get started and you actually are selling to people and they're not interested. Get those insights then. Right now, you actually want to talk to people that are going to give you valuable insights about your service. Another thing to note that I really want to put out there is avoid written surveys, conduct face-to-face -face Zoom, you know, or Google Meets or Microsoft or whatever, um, or call or phone calls. So engage in conversation. You know, if, if you've ever heard that communicate, when we talk about communication, you might have heard that 70% of communication is nonverbal. I think it might even be more than that. There's a lot of things that you learn from just nonverbal cues about tone, uh, voice, and things like that. So you can see, you know, when they're talking about their problems, when they really get heated over one problem, you know that that's a priority. So you can really get a lot of emphasis from verbal cues and or nonverbal cues, things like that. So not just what they say, but also what they, the actions and, and things that they convey. And another thing with written surveys is you got to factor in all kinds of bias. So people not giving honest answer, people being biased based on how you ask the question and what they think the desired answer should be. Uh, you never know you know, necessarily like if you mass, mass market your surveys, you never know what percentage of people are actually going to be potential customers. Surveys are not great forms of data for this process. But that being said, you might have a supplemental survey that you want to just send out to some people that just don't can't talk to you. It might be a good idea. It might be a waste of time. I wouldn't. I, I would say it's not necessary. But you might want to do that just to get some extra insights and data. But again, try to set up the conversations. You only need a couple. Literally, I would even say two, two, three 
four or five, like five max. May, I mean, more if you want, but five max in this early stage here, just to get those insights to try to have different people try to have like, you know, different, like men, women, uh, a mix there uh, in age groups, you know, younger baby boomers or older millennials, people in their late thirties slash early forties. And then maybe if you can have someone in their sixties, uh, they might be a good, you know, good variety. You would just really need to talk to a couple of people in this process. We're not really coming up with a completely new service. We're just trying to understand how our service currently works and what opportunities there are. All right. So I hope that helps. So if you're struggling to find people, use the Start Smart Inc. network to your advantage. So I know a lot of us don't have access to a huge network. So definitely use our network. We're all, remember, we're all doing customer discovery right now uh, at different stages. So feel free to post on the network. Reach out to some people that are you see are actively doing this. That's why it's so important to keep everyone involved in your, in your startup journey. Because you never know if one person finds a great person to talk to. They're really open to talking to students. They really gave a lot of good insights. They might be someone who's great to talk to you. You as well and might be reach out even if you don't know them this might be a great person to reach out to or talking to one of your fellow students that are also starting your business who got some great insights and maybe they're doing a similar service and you can use those insights so use the start smart network here to your advantage it's a huge advantage in this process especially in just finding people to talk to and setting up these interviews uh, because certain people are going to be really happy to talk to you. Others are going to be maybe just give you a quick conversation. So finding the right people is really important. So this can be a really great opportunity. So use the network when you're doing customer discovery, make a post about it, post your post your question. We were talking about questions in a second, but post your questions that you're asking, do things like that. Use the network to your advantage. You'll really help others out and you'll help yourself out in turn. All right, so here are some things you should ask. This is not the perfect survey or survey questionnaire, however you want to say it, but these are some very specific questions that I think will really help you get some valuable insights. All right, so always first start off by getting some personal information. Down the line, this person might be a potential customer for you, so it is a good idea to get their phone number and email or one of the two. Definitely get their location because this will give you an idea of, you know, if you talk to people in different locations, then you'll see maybe the market is just different in different locations. And then age, occupation. Age, I think, is, is key because you can see what demographic they fit in. And occupation, you can see, you know, maybe you talk to five people and they're all completely different occupations and you notice a trend uh, for certain occupations and others, you, you know, you don't. You don't get that insight. Maybe they just give you insight. So a professor, for example, might tell you, you know, I, from my experience, professors, uh, the professors I know, people in my network don't like this service for this, 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 and this, or have these problems for this, this, and this reason. So you, these are good, this good information to have. Don't make it mandatory. If they don't want to give it to you, then fair enough. Or if you can find that elsewhere, if you can find, you know, if you go on their LinkedIn, you find their graduation year for university, you probably get an idea. Typically people graduate at 22, 23 years old. So you can backtrack and see how old they are now. Um, so try to get this information on your own, uh, but if you need to ask, then ask them directly. And then definitely start off with, have you gotten these services before? That's probably going to be, that's going to be a very important question because you need to know uh, what kind of data you're getting from someone. And that was a mistake I made. I talked to people and more than half of the people I talked to had never, actually, you know what? Pretty much everyone I talked to had never gotten the services before. So uh, it's not a good, it's not going to help you that much if they've never gotten the services before. And they're not going to provide you that many insights. They're going to provide you insights maybe from similar services or similar experiences. But if they don't have direct experience, it's not going to provide you with a lot of the insights that you need. All right. So if yes, these are a couple questions. You know, why did you get these services? So understanding what made what compelled them, this is really going to understand you know, what were their problems, what were their challenges, and this is a way you can elaborate. You can ask them you know, what were the pain points that led you to actually need these services. So you're establishing the need or the problem right there. Talk about how frequently they require the services. So this can give you some insight for your service for how you're going to position your company, how how you know how many times. You know, if they, if it's a one time or a once a year, or maybe it's a every other year, maybe it's weekly, maybe it's monthly. It's going to help you determine your business model, how you're going to, uh, how you actually hit your revenue targets, things like that. Uh, how did you find your service provider is going to help you get some insights on how they, what their discovery process was for, for, um, actually going out and finding the provider. So whether it was it word of mouth, was it someone they've used forever? How loyal are they to that person? Was it uh, just a Google search? They used reviews and and uh, what they found online. So figure out how they how they did, and then asking like, would you hire a student to perform these services? That's important because that'll establish you know is this what's the market perception on being a student? Is it someone who's not capable of these services? Is it someone they would be more than happy to support? Get a feel for that. Uh, what was your customer experience like? So asking them like what the booking process, how they act, how they booked their services, so how they got a quote, how they scheduled, how they did that. Um, 
you know, when they actually got the service done, when it was being delivered, was it done by a student? Was it done by a part-time or was it done just by a general laborer, part-time person, anyone like that? What was their customer experience like in general? Like, how did they feel about it? Uh, and then what did you like about your experience? What did you not like about your experience? So these are going to, uh, these are going to give some insights into where your opportunities are with that. Um, and then what are the price, what price did you pay for the service or just like a rough price estimate and how important was price determining your, uh, if you get this service. So these are some good questions to go off. These are really going to provide you a lot of insights when you're thinking about building your business plans. So I'd suggest um, just a higher level note here, before you actually engage in these interviews, think about your, you know, use these questions as an example to think about your operations, think about what you really need to know the most. So we're going to think about our problems, but when we're creating a solution. We want to make sure that we understand what the solution is out there right now to really diagnose that and analyze that. So these are some good starter questions. You know, you might have a couple other questions. Don't have too many questions uh, because you are going to keep, uh, we're going to talk about this in a second, but you can keep it conversational. You're going to keep it flowing and certain topics you'll find that people give you a lot of insights on, certain topics it won't be as many insights. So you don't want to load them with questions because throughout each, you know, throughout the interview, you can ask them additional questions that will come up on the spot. If they've never gotten the service before, ask them why not. Make this a shorter interview or you know, maybe ask them similar services, related services. They might still be able to provide you some insights. But ask them why not. Like, Did they not have the problem? Did they just think this wasn't a good deal, wasn't worth it? number of reasons. And then would you consider this if this was not the case? So if they tell you a problem and you have a solution to that problem, would they consider that? Would they consider getting the services? Would they change their mind? And then you can ask them some questions, maybe some related services and get some insights there. But overall, if they haven't gotten this service, it's probably not a good, it's probably not a good idea to, uh, to chat with them. So keep your interview conversational is probably the most important note here. Don't be looking down uh, at your notepad the whole time. Just take some odd notes. But I found the best insights I got was just talking to people out loud, just having a candid conversation with them and just going with the flow. Just, you know, going with it. And then after the interview is done, take a bunch of notes. Take it some as you go. But don't be looking down at your notepad the whole time. Like no one wants to do that. If someone's going to help you get off the ground, they want to have a conversation with you. They want to chat with you and actually get to know you as well. And, you know, I think that's a great opportunity to build a relationship and get comfortable with building relationships with people in this demographic. So keep it conversational. After your interview, uh, ask your interviewee for referrals after the interview. So this is really key if you, especially if you're struggling to find people to interview, which I, I think all of us might struggle a little bit to find people, you know, when we're thinking about our initial network and then using Start Smart Network after that. We might, you know, be tapped out of people that we actually know we can talk to. So ask the interviewee for referrals, ask them if they have any friends or anyone else that you can chat with and ask them specifically for the contact information, like ask them for the email, phone number, whatever it may be. And, you know, don't make them go out of their way for this process. They've already done a lot. They've already provided you with a lot of value. So just ask them if there's anyone you can contact, you can reach out to, and then you'll do the reach out after that. You'll say, you know, John mentioned uh, that, uh, you know, I, I talked to John about my startup and I now want to talk to you about it. I have, you know, I, I'm not trying to sell you yada, yada, yada. So try to get some referrals, really important. Just like when we're, you know, when we're getting our business off the ground, we want referrals from customers. Try to get referrals for this only if you need to, you know, if you only if you need a couple more people to talk to, but it's all, also just like a good idea. It can just expand your network. So there's no reason why not to. So make sure you end the interview with that. All right. So let's assume you've done some uh, customer discovery, or maybe you want to watch this whole video, do your customer discovery afterwards by all means, uh, however you want to do it. So if you need to pause, maybe do some customer discovery first, uh, go for it. But if you want to just, you know, get through this, we'll talk about it all. And then you can revert back uh, and look at some sections individually. Um, so analyzing your customer discovery interview is really important. We're not going to just do this survey and, or, or do this interview and just be done with it. We want to actually analyze it. So if you perform the customer discovery process correctly, the chances are you're going to discover some things that you didn't already consider. Maybe you did consider. So let's say, for example, you made a massive list of jobs, pains, and gains, and uh, you know, job, uh, services, pain, pain relievers, and gain creators. Let's say you made a massive list and you did cover everything, but you realized that there was only a couple that came up in the interview time and time again. So maybe you didn't have the problem where you, you know, you, you didn't consider something, but you didn't consider how important something was. But also maybe you just had things that you never considered. So that's really great. At this point, you have the opportunity to return to the drawing board and incorporate what you've learned and repeat the process. So that's gonna be really, that's gonna be really awesome because you you remember you're a scientist in this process. You have an open mind. You haven't built your business yet. So at this point, you have the opportunity to really return and create uh, a new drawing board, incorporate what you've learned. 
once your customer's uh, responses match your hypothesis, you can move on confidently knowing that you've, you're have you about to build something that your customers actually want. So that's the goal of this process. Don't get frustrated. Don't get you know beat down if you're you know if you were completely wrong with with the value proposition that you present that you created beforehand. So use this as an opportunity to build that. And you might have to you might have to do that multiple times, but you do want to make sure that you're moving forward confidently. So it may seem frustrated, you know, frustrating to go back, revise your original idea, but think about this: it's far far better and cheaper to revise your your idea now at the beginning than after you've already spent significant time and money building your service around false or potentially false assumptions. So think about it, you know, it might be frustrating now and even if you have to do it multiple times, it might be super frustrating, but if you launch on on the wrong hypothesis, you know, that you're building your business around, you might think it's amazing. You might think you're addressing the biggest problem in the world, but really no one is responding to it. So this is a really time saver, energy saver, money saver in the process. So make sure you do it. And finally, this gives you a distinct advantage over everyone else in your market. Someone may be building the fastest product, but you'll be and you'll be and you'll end up building the best product. And, and further to that, someone might be established for 20 years and think and, and look like they have this really great business, have a bunch of reviews, decent website and everything like that. But you're having a distinct advantage because you're coming in with a fresh look based on what the current customers needs and problems are customers needs and problems change over time this is something that's current and you're looking at a current view of it so this is why i i don't get intimidated by compet I, I say i say time and time again you shouldn't get intimidated by competitors because it doesn't matter you're building something different all right so you might need to do this process a couple times it's okay so we allow you to move forward with confidence that's the biggest thing you want to take away from this you want to remember that that this discovery process is helping you understand the problem that you're solving all right so the action now is to crush those interviews Give this a pause and do that. We're going to finish off the lesson talking about how we're going to refine our value proposition, but crush those interviews, get started on them. It's a process, all right? So it's not going to be uh, a one-off, uh, you know, it's not going to be a, a quick, you know, a couple hours you can put into this. You're going to have to set up these interviews. You're going to have to figure out a time. You have to schedule them. Try to keep a short time frame, like try to keep it within the next couple of days. Get these conversations in. Be willing to do it outside of main hours, like at night, early in the morning. Be flexible around these people's schedules, but try to get these interviews done ASAP, all right? So before moving on to the next stage of, you know, the next stage of our building, building our business, so you've already done your customer discovery at this point, but we want to make sure that we're updating your value proposition canvas based on what you've learned. Narrow your points down to a few main focuses for your business and use your value proposition and customer discovery process to drive your business decisions going forward. All right. Forget about the assumptions that you had. Use the use the actual verified facts that your customers are giving you. All right. Super important. So let's go back. I'm going to do Matt's car cleaning final value proposition. So disclaimer here, I'm not doing customer discovery for Matt's car cleaning business. This is my guess again. So this is not what you want to do, um, but this is to show you an example based on, you know, again, my guess of what I assume I would come up with after uh, doing the process. All right. So you can see this much shorter on the same page here. We look at the customer profile and value map. So gains, being proud of the car and have the feeling of driving a brand new car. All right. So the customer, I've you know I've talked to them hypothetically, and they've talked they've told me that they just want to feel like they're driving a brand new car every year. They want to make they want to be proud of that car. The biggest pain is that it's expensive and it's inconvenient. Uh, service offered by current companies. They hate how much they pay. And the process is not convenient for them. All right. So they they really value convenience. They don't want to put any time into this, and they hate spending all that money. And their primary job: drive a clean car. That's all they want to do with the service. They're not thinking too much more about it. So how is our value model co correspond to that? Number one, gain creators. Help the customer feel good in their car by focusing on a process on the de focusing our process on the details that matter. So with our clean process, maybe our assumption was that the car we wanted to, you know, do a very thorough cleaning of the trunk of the different areas that are the messiest but maybe the customer just really wants the outside to look good they want the main areas that they're going to see the most often look good so we're going to build our process around that because again they want to feel like they're driving a brand new car they want the areas that they see they want it to look brand new all right so that's a that's a game creator that we discovered through this process we're going to focus on pain reliever lowest price on the market with next day service we're going to relieve all their pains because we're literally going to charge the least and we're going to be the most convenient we're going to go to them the next day we're not going to take a bunch of information from them we're literally just going to book them get the job done 
And lastly, our service, professional mobile car detailing services aimed at enhancing the driving experience. That's our tagline. That's our value proposition statement right there. We're not just car cleaning service. We're a professional mobile car detailing service aimed at enhancing the driving experience. All right. So that's what we broke it down to. This is our simplified value proposition, our final value proposition. We're going to look at this. And when we're moving forward with our, our marketing, with our sales, with our operations, building out the compo components of our system and how we're going to actually run our business, we're going to refer to this value proposition canvas right here. This is verified from our customers based on what they said and it's narrowly focused. We don't have a bunch of points anymore. We have a few we have one literally one point, maybe two points for each of our each of our sections here and we've really analyzed our problems so we can feel confident going forward. All right, so your action now is to create your final value proposition finish your customer discovery get this done don't spend a crazy amount of time i know i say this a lot for these early sections but the reason i say it is because there's a lot of activities we got to do to get our business off the ground so we want to go through these process the, these parts of the process seamlessly we want to get used to that feeling of being uncomfortable feeling that time crunch there's a lot of things we got to do as an entrepreneur you guys took the leap i'm going to make sure that i push you through it and as always definitely at this stage use the network to your advantage Definitely post about your customer discovery and post your final value proposition. Share it off to the network. We'll talk about it together. Message me if you need some support. As always, go out there and crush it. It's a really fun stage. You're a scientist. You're an, you're an entrepreneur at this point, and we want to continue being one of those. All right, so let's get to it.